Aloha. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at International Church, where together we aim to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. So glad that you are with us today. You know, there's a a playful saying among preachers that says, if you want to draw a crowd, well, you just preach on sex or the end times. Well, we thought uh, to draw a huge crowd, why not put the two together and let's talk about sex in the end times? Well, or as I softened it a little bit more for the title, marriage in the afterlife. Now I might go, what? Why are we talking about this? What a weird topic. Are, are we just fascinated by this? No, not in particularly, though uh, we're just going to address it as we continue to move through the Gospel of Mark as part of the series that we've been in. This is a question that some religious leaders brought to Jesus. They wanted to know what he thought about it. You know, the question of life after death is one that's fascinated humans, well, as long as we know for forever. As long as we've been around, people have wondered what happens after we die. Every single religion looks to answer that question in some way or some form, and well, the opinions vary quite widely. In recent surveys, 80% of Americans said that they believe in life after death in some form. Another 9% said they're not sure which means that only one in ten Americans is completely convinced that there is nothing that happens after death. A very strong majority is convinced that something more is still to come. This ain't it. That this life is not all that there is. That our existence on this planet is not going to completely end us. We will continue on in some way. Now, the problem is that there's all kinds of rampant misconceptions about what the afterlife looks like, even among Christians. Those of us who believe in Jesus, who believe that we have eternal life with God, there's still a lot of confusion about what exactly Scripture says and teaches about heaven, about earth, about us, and about what is coming. Some of it's made up, some of it's fabricated, and some of it is true. So what is true about the afterlife? What's true about us? What's true about our our relationships and our bodies? What's true about a resurrection? Well, these are important questions to answer because they affect every single one of us. Every single person is affected by what still lies ahead. And the text this morning gives us an opportunity to explore this more. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it up to the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 12. As I mentioned, we're in a series right now called With Authority. As Jesus is coming toward the end of His ministry on earth, He is coming to Jerusalem, and we're reading in Mark chapters 11, 12, and 13 how He comes to the temple, and He clears the temple, and He teaches and speaks and acts as one who has infinite authority. I mean, there's never been a human leader, a human teacher, a rabbi who has acted and taught the way that Jesus has. He is showing true authority, a kind of authority that no other person has ever had before or since. And the people, they are amazed at Him. But the religious leaders, those who had the authority at this time, and in Jerusalem, well, they really, really hate him. They, they keep trying to publicly discredit him and to challenge him, but so far, Jesus has rebuffed every attempt of theirs to come at him. And today, we're going to see that once again, Jesus is embroiled in one of these so-called temple controversies. Uh, we're going to hit number four of six. So, let's see how he handles it in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. If you'll read with me, beginning in verse 18. Where Mark sets the scene for us by saying, Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. So, what happened just before this is Jesus answered a question by the group of the Pharisees and the Herodians, which Pastor Dennis taught us about last week. And now the Sadducees come. So, this is a different but very powerful group. It's not a big group. It was a small group of of elite, um, wealthy, aristocratic priests 
in Jerusalem. And a lot of Jews felt that the Sadducees were like religious sellouts. They weren't the most popular group, even among their own people. And that's because the Sadducees, these rich, wealthy priests, had buddied up with Rome, right, with the the oppressors, the ones who had colonized Palestine at this time. And uh, they're very fond of Greek culture. They're very kind of pro-Hellenism and very pro-the world and not very protective of Jewish identity and Jewish culture. Now, because these are the guys who are friends with Rome and Rome likes these Sadducees, they've put the Sadducees in charge of the temple. Right? So these are some of the guys that are responsible for the mess that Jesus found in the temple that he needed to clear out, the injustice that was happening toward the poor and the Gentiles that was keeping people from God. The Sadducees were the guys who were benefiting off that. Right, so these, these are the ones who didn't like Jesus coming in and upsetting their rigged game. This was all working out in their favor. They, were, they very much liked the status quo. They did not like the news that here comes some foreign king claiming to have authority over them. Oh, no, that's it's not at all what they're about. So they don't like Jesus. They don't like what he is saying and coming to teach or say or do. And now in verse 18... Mark tells us this is a group that did not believe in the resurrection, right? So they did not think that there was an existence of of personhood beyond physical death. Now, we need to know that this was actually not the common view in the first century. Most Jews believed in the future resurrection. Most Jews looked forward to a time when God would raise his people back from the dead, where he would vindicate those who have trusted in him in in some kind of mass resurrection. There would be a time when people would receive new bodies, uh, new life. God was going to remake this world and establish his kingdom forever. That's what most Jews expected but not the Sadducees. Why not them? Why did they take a different view on things? It's because the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Bible as authoritative. They only believed in the law, in the Torah, in in what Moses wrote, in Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's all that they saw as Scripture. They, They ignored anything that a prophet said after Moses. And they said, well, since there's no mention of the resurrection in those first five books in the Torah, then, well, that resurrection must not be a real thing. So this group has come with a question for Jesus. What is that question? Read with me, beginning in verse 19. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children... The man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since all seven were married to her. Have you ever had a kid come to you with just like a ridiculous question? You're like, um, what? Where, where did you come up with that? The other day while we were having breakfast, one of my girls said to me, Dad, Dad, okay, Dad, if something really bad happened, like really bad, Dad, like, like, Dad, like a tsunami hit the whole world, and everybody died except our family. Everybody else died. Dad, what would you do? <laughs> well, I, you know, babe, um, I don't know, but how about we cross that bridge when we get to it, okay? Why don't you eat some more cereal? Oh, kids, they have, they have great questions. No, no one but a kid would ask me what my fifth favorite animal is, which I, one of my kids recently asked me. They told me they're four and five favorites. And to me, this question from the Sadducees sounds like some like ridiculous scenario that they have just made up. Some scholars think it might have its basis in a Jewish allegory that is told in the book of Tobit, but still, it's, it's, this is a whack story. This is, is, a, is a wild scenario. 
What, what is this question about? Well, they start by referencing what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 25 regarding something called the Leverite marriage. Uh, back then, if a man died and he didn't have any children, his brother or his next nearest relative was supposed to step in, marry the woman, and provide offspring on the dead man's behalf. Obviously, we don't really practice this today, but back then, this was a way to ensure that the family line would continue and a way to ensure that the woman was taken care of. You see, in those times, it was not common for women to work, to earn an income, to earn wages. So a woman would have a hard time getting an income without husbands and sons and property. So this provision in this law, uh, it was meant to offer some familial as well as economic protection. Now, the Sadducees tell them about this woman whose husband dies. She marries his six brothers, one after the other. They all die. No kids. The woman finally dies too. It's a really happy story. Right? Disney's going to turn this into a movie. It's going to be fantastic. And then they get to their main point. Right? This, is, this is the gotcha. This is why they've told this thing. They say to Jesus, whose wife will she be in heaven? They're trying to make the idea of the resurrection look silly, look like nonsense. They're going, come on, Jesus, this afterlife thing can't work. Uh, are all seven brothers going to be married to the same woman? Come on, Jesus, do the math. Are all seven going to sleep with her? No, no way. That's just not going to happen, right? It, it, this can't work, Jesus. And so if this resurrection, this afterlife, can't even make sense of a simple familial marriage problem, then it's going to be fraught with problems, fraught with disaster. This afterlife thing, it's probably not even real anyway. The case is closed. Jesus, thanks so much. Take care. Have a great day. That's what they think is going to happen. But these fools done messed with the wrong rabbi because Jesus, who's the most brilliant and authoritative teacher of all time, is not scared by the silly question at all. Check out his answer in verses 24 and 25. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, for they will be like the angels in heaven. Oh, Jesus comes out strong. You are in error. And here's why they're in error. It says, clearly, you do not know your Bible, and clearly, you do not know the power of God. Yikes, them fighting words. Jesus says these guys have badly mistaken about what is to come in the next age, mainly because they're assuming the next age is going to be exactly like this one. But Jesus is pointing out that life then is not going to be the exact same as life is now. Those who believe in him, they will be resurrected and they will exist, but it will be a, a different kind of existence. It's still the same person, but it, it'll be a little different. There is both continuity and discontinuity between this age and the age to come. And marriage is apparently one of those elements that is going to be discontinued in the new heavens and the new earth. We might say, well, why is that? What's so, so bad about marriage? Why would we get rid of that? Why don't we need that in heaven? Well, the Bible speaks of three main purposes for marriage on earth, and uh, here they all are, and they all start with C because, well, that's just what preachers do. Three purposes of marriage. The first one is children. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, when God crowned His creation by creating man and woman, bringing them together in marriage, He tells them their job is to fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, make babies. Such a great verse. God does not expect Adam and Eve to just like shake hands and hang out, right? He, he is expecting them to make love and have babies. That is part of the design. Now, obviously, we need to be sensitive to the fact that not every couple has children or is able to have children. As fallen creatures in a fallen world, things like procreation don't always work the way that they were intended to work. Infertility is a very real struggle. It can cause a lot of very real grief 
for people. We recognize that. Yet we also, as we step back and look at the overall design, we look at the Word of God, we see that children are undoubtedly part of the design and intention for marriage. Second C is companionship. We also see in Genesis 1 that God made Eve for Adam because he was alone, and it was not good for him to be alone. So God provided a woman as a suitable helper. Now, the word helper does not mean his sidekick or his servant or someone like way down on the org chart. Uh, The word, it means an equal but an opposite. It means a complement. Husbands and wives are are meant to complement one another. Though we are different, we think and act and behave different, we look different, our bodies are different, we have different roles in the marriage, but we go together. Men and women need one another if we're going to fulfill the calling that God has put on our lives. And, And the third C is Christ. Now, this one doesn't become clear until we reach the New Testament, but Paul writes in Ephesians 5 that it's, it's an important and mysterious truth about marriage, is that marriage points to Jesus. Part of its design is it's meant to illuminate the relationship between Jesus and His bride, between Christ and the church. It mirrors the relationship of husband and wife. The husband is meant to reflect the self-giving and sacrificial leadership of Jesus, and the wife displays the love, the trust, and the followership of the church in the way that she respects her husband. Both of them are important. Both are beautiful. Marriage points to Christ. And if you look at these three reasons, it appears that really none of those three are ultimately needed in heaven. Regarding one, we're no longer going to be having babies and bearing children. There's no indication in Scripture that that is going to continue. Secondly, the companionship that spouses enjoy, well, it's going to give way to a a more perfect, a more complete fellowship that's going to include the whole family of God. We're all going to experience it together without sin. We're going to have this perfect and complete unity together. And thirdly, the union of God and His people through Christ, which marriage points towards, it, it won't really need to point to anymore because, well, Jesus is right there. Like, you, you can go point to Him yourself. We'll already have that relationship, that marriage foreshadows. Our union with Christ is going to be fully achieved, fully realized. Now, some of us might hear this and actually become a little bit sad, a little bit disappointed. Like, what? There's there's no marriage in heaven? Does this mean that my marriage doesn't matter? Are my spouse and I going to, like, not know each other or or have any kind of special connection this whole time on earth? This just means nothing? No, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that at all. This doesn't mean that our memories are going to be gone. This isn't even necessarily saying that nuclear family won't have some kind of special connection. We don't know. Rather, we know that marriage is going to be replaced. And with that, Jesus here is emphasizing that, hey, together, all of us, as the people of God, we're going to enjoy God and one another in far greater intimacy and far greater unity than a marriage even has right now. It's going to be better than we ever thought possible. And the same goes for for sex in heaven. Now, now the Bible doesn't address the question of sex precisely, as saying, is this going to be in heaven or not? But we can be confident of a couple different things. One, we know that our glorified bodies are going to maintain our unique identities, right? They're not going to become aliens. They're still human bodies. And God created humans to be male and female. So sex in the sense is that we are gendered human beings. That's going to continue, Right? Your sex is part of who you are as a human. Being male and female is part of our humanity. But whatever physical or sensual or sexual pleasure that we enjoy in this life, we know is going to be transcended by something better in the future, in, in the life to come. Think of it maybe this way. If the new heavens and the new earth are perfect as the Bible says they are, and if there is no marriage or sexual activity in heaven, it's only because they weren't good enough to make it in. It's only because they've been replaced by something better than that. 
So there really isn't a need to, to be sad that marriage won't be there. The Scriptures and the power of God testify that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And what we need to do as God's people is to trust this. We need to believe the Scriptures and the power of God when they tell us that. We need to know and trust what Scripture says. When we see that God's power can raise Jesus from the dead, then surely He is powerful enough to create an existence that is better than we can even imagine, that's better than what we've had so far. We need to not fall into the same trap that the, that the Pharisees did. We need to not shorten God's omnipotence with our human understanding, with our finite limitations. What we need to do is to trust that for those who follow Christ, the best is yet to come. Now, we also maybe need to clarify a couple misunderstandings about Jesus' simile. He says that we will be like the angels in heaven in verse 25. Now, two things he's, he's not saying. He is not saying that humans become angels. Right? Humans do not become angels when we die. Angels are distinct spiritual beings. They are not human. They are different. Sometimes when a, a person dies, we maybe hear a phrase, somebody say, uh, I mean, like that, something like heaven gained another angel. While we can maybe understand the sentiment of what the person is trying to say, theologically, it's, it's actually just not true. That's not what happens. A person doesn't suddenly become an angel. We remain human beings. Jesus is saying with this, this simile that with respect to children and marriage, we will be like the angels who also do not procreate. But we're still going to stay separate from angels. We're going to be different creatures with different activities and goals, even different relationships with God. 1 Corinthians 6.3 says that Christians are going to be lifted above the angels, and we're actually going to sit in judgment over them. Nor is Jesus saying, the second thing, that we're not going to have physical bodies, that we're going to be like the angels who are just spiritual creatures. And this is perhaps one of the most common misconceptions uh, regarding the afterlife, that eternity is just, you know, us floating around on clouds up in heaven, playing harps surrounded by naked baby angels painted in gold. Like, that's kind of a picture we get. of well, That's heaven floating around for all of eternity in some really long worship set that won't end. No, no, that's not what heaven is going to be. It's not just this spiritual existence that's freed from physical and material world. That kind of an idea has its root in Greek philosophy. It was Greek philosophers who stressed this strict dualism. They're the ones who thought spiritual good, physical bad. But Christianity tells a different story. Christianity has a different belief that God, who is spirit, created the universe, the physical world, as good. And though the world became corrupted through sin, God chose to rescue His creation with the Son taking on physical form, that the spiritual and the physical are united in Him. And though both physical and spiritual became corrupted by sin, in Christ, both of them are reconciled to God. Both of them become good again. We're going to have bodies and they're going to be better bodies than these ones. They're not going to break down. They're going to function perfectly. Romans 8.23 says we are awaiting the redemption of our bodies at the future resurrection. There's a, the author Randy Alcorn who wrote a book about that fat on heaven that I encourage you to read at some time if you're looking for some light reading about the afterlife. And here's what he says about heaven. He says on the new earth, emphasizing it's going to be a heaven and earth together, a new physical spiritual existence. On the new earth, there will be natural wonders, animals, trees, rivers, cities, houses, and architecture. We will laugh, eat, and drink, tell stories, make crafts, build, garden, care for animals, play, enjoy sports, and physically demanding activities, and we will tend to and manage and rule the earth. We will collaborate, research, invent, read books, and write them. We're going to create and perform dramas. We're going to compose music and perform it all to God's glory. Why? P. 
because we will still be physical beings created in God's image, which means we are creative and intelligent. We will be restored to a new earth without sin and death to fulfill God's original plan of stewarding the material universe to his eternal glory. Okay, well, that sounds fun. You sign me up for that. That's what's awaiting us. That's what we mean as Christians when we say that the Scriptures and the power of God testify that the best is yet to come. The coming resurrection is real. It is a real event. It is going to happen. Even if the Sadducees don't think so. Even if one in ten of Americans don't think so. And Jesus is actually going to correct them on that point too. All right? he, he already addressed their erroneous views on marriage in the afterlife. Now he's going to show them the afterlife truly is real. Hear what he says in verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses? Notice the sarcasm. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So Jesus proves the resurrection is real from the Torah right, from the law, from their book, the only ones that they'll take as authoritative. Jesus could have jumped into Daniel or Isaiah, but he went to their home turf. He went into the book of Exodus, the only portion they accepted as being from God, and to show them what they've missed, that the resurrection is actually there. Jesus quotes God speaking to Moses, saying that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus concludes he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. What's Jesus saying? What's his point? See, when God revealed himself to Moses, he pointed to the patriarchs, right? He pointed back in time to the patriarchs of the faith. And he could have said, hey, it's me, Yahweh. I I was the God of Abraham. I was also the God of Isaac, I was also the God of Jacob, but he didn't. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is amazing to me that Jesus' response to the Sadducees hangs on a fairly small grammatical feature in one verse back in Exodus. The presence of the verb am versus was. For me personally, this is one of those things that's a really strong proof for what Jesus thought about Scripture, how highly he esteemed the Word of God, that he accepted the Old Testament as true and inspired by the Holy Spirit because he believed that Scripture was reliable, so reliable, Jesus went down to the details of the tense of a verb in the Hebrew. That's amazing. Friends, if it's If Jesus trusts the Bible, we who follow him can and should trust the Bible. It is trustworthy. It is authoritative. Not only can we know it, but we can trust it, even in its small grammatical features. Scripture is trustworthy, which is why at International Church, we spend so much of our worship services reading it and trying to understand and apply it in our lives. We can trust Scripture. And since Scripture points clearly to the resurrection, we can trust it. It is clearly taught the coming resurrection is a real, physical event. The Scriptures and the power of God testify that the best is yet to come. And there are portions that are far more explicit than that back in Exodus. For example, we can read what the Apostle John wrote in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20 says, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The books that were opened was recorded what humans had done. Everything we've said, thought, and done is recorded by God. That book will be opened. But he says there's another book, the book of life. 
and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, what we call hell. And the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The resurrection is real. It is real. And not only is it real, but it's actually the great hope of the Christian faith that there is going to be a time when we are raised to new life and we are vindicated before God because of what the Lamb has done on our behalf, because of Jesus who died in our place. The resurrection is the great hope of the Christian faith. It's not some weird add-on. It is the centerpiece of our salvation. The fact that Jesus is going to recreate us and he's going to remake this universe, that he takes away our sin and our death and, and he gives us life for all eternity, that can only be worth anything if there is a resurrection, if there is life after death. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. He says, if there's no resurrection, there's no point. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are all lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection is everything. Jesus and Christianity are the only ones that, that can offer a person a renewed and perfected existence beyond this world. And that offer stands for no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Heaven does not hinge on our performance, on our circumstances, on our good works or our good intentions. Heaven on earth is guaranteed for those who trust in Jesus for those whose names are written in the book of life. And so Paul comforts those. He says, hey, those whom we have lost, those who have already died ahead of us, we can have a hope, a hope that we will see them again, a hope that we will be raised to new life with them. If their names are written in the book of life, then we will spend eternity together. Not everybody has that hope. In contrast, Buddhism, for example does not have this hope. In fact, it discourages such hopes. Devout Buddhists are supposed to be free. They're supposed to free themselves from desires, from connections to the material world, to this life, this existence. Buddhism teaches that everything passes, that nothing is permanent, that all is fleeting, all is temporary. You just need to accept it. Accept it. Don't don't wish it were otherwise. Don't wish it all. For desires is part of what your problem is. And it's just this very hopeless way of living. Just to illustrate, in the late 1700s, there was a Japanese poet and Buddhist priest named Kobayashi Isa. And he gave his life to the studies of Buddhism and was a teacher himself. And Isa had a really hard life. His mother had died when he was a young child. His stepmother mistreated and beat him every day. He nursed his father while he eventually succumbed to typhoid. And he went into the, the priesthood uh, and did not get married until he was 51 years old. But his first son died within a month of being born. His second son died within a month of being born. He then had a daughter who survived infancy, but when she was a toddler, she contracted smallpox and passed away. While giving birth to another son, both the child and his wife passed away during childbirth. I mean, Isa experienced a lot of loss and tragedy, and at one point in his life, he penned this now famous haiku. He writes, The world of dew... A world of dew it is indeed, and yet, and yet. You see, Isa knew that this world was temporary, 
that it was fading, that, that this was just a world of dew, that it comes and it goes and it evaporates. He, he knew his religion taught him he should dissociate himself from what is. It's not right to long for what is lost. There shouldn't be grief. There shouldn't be loss. There should just be what is. Instead, Isa should simply accept what has happened. Buddhism does not offer him any hope of seeing his parents or his children or his wife again. He is convinced of this. He believes these things. He knows that's what he's supposed to, to believe. And yet, and yet, deep down he longs for that to be untrue. He longs for his loved ones. He wants to hope for a happy reunion. He wishes that there was something more lasting than due in the universe. He wishes that the best were still to come. I think any one of us who have lost loved ones, we can understand that pain and that desire. And the good news that I wish I could go back in time and tell Isa is that Jesus is the fulfillment of that desire. That in Christ, there is an answer to that human longing. That death will come untrue. That Jesus is the hero of our faith who can provide us with that hope because Jesus is with authority. He has authority over life and over the afterlife. Which is why he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? A resurrection is real. Jesus is the resurrection. He is proof of the resurrection. In him there is the resurrection that is to come. And he says, For those whose names are written in the book of life, they will spend eternity with him in the new heavens, in the new earth. Do you believe that? See, the gospel tells us that we are sinners. As humans, we have turned ourselves from God and that we're dead in our sin. Because we've rejected him, we await judgment and condemnation for our sin. But if we continue without Jesus, if we don't repent, if we don't trust in him, then our sin stays on us. Then death and judgment is all that we have to look forward to. The promises of a resurrection, the promises of new life, are only for those who have been reconciled to God, who are in a relationship with Him. And the door for relationship with God, the door to the Father, is the Son to accept Jesus. The offer of the invitation is there for all who will respond. Because God, in His great mercy, in His great love, even when we were dead, He made us alive in Christ. He came to give His life for us while we were enemies. We have been saved by grace through faith. God loves you. He did not want to leave you in your sin, in your rebellion. He does not want you to end up in an eternal lake of fire, which is why he sent Jesus to rescue anyone who will believe in him. Will you believe? When we accept Jesus, we not only get the the eternal life promise in the future, but that eternal life actually starts now. We get to start experiencing what is to come now. We're like relics of the future, new heavens and new earth as God's people, as He begins the process of making all things new on this side of judgment. He will finish it when He returns. And we can have hope that when we face death, On the other side of the resurrection, there will be a real, physical, eternal, and glorious existence in the new world forever for all those who will trust in Jesus. So have you trusted in Him? Have you committed your life to Him? If not, I encourage you to do it today. For the Scriptures and the power of God testify that the best is yet to come, and I want you to experience that best. So will you trust in Jesus. You see, when it comes to to taking this message that Jesus gave the Sadducees, this text, we might go, what does this have to do with our lives today? What does this say to us? Well, it's an invitation for us to trust. It's an invitation to trust Jesus and his message, to trust his authority and his power over life and death. 
And trusting in Jesus is the necessary step one. We trust in Jesus. He is the only way to be saved. He's the only way to access and experience the new creation. Jesus demonstrated that He alone has power over death and the resurrection by Himself conquering death and coming back to life. His life serves as a guarantee for you and for me about what is to come. So we must trust in Him. Second thing we do is we can trust in the Scriptures and in the power of God. Both the Bible and the power of God testify to the reality of the resurrection, that it's a real thing. It is going to happen. Jesus says this. Jesus proves this. So we need to not be like the Sadducees who ignore God's Word or who doubt God's omnipotence. God can do anything. He is able to fulfill all of His promises all of His promises for a new and renewed and perfected physical, spiritual existence for all who will believe in His Son. God can do it. He has authority over life and over the afterlife. And finally, we need to trust that the best is yet to come. This world, this ain't it. So stop hoping in this world. Stop putting your hopes that this world is going to satisfy. This world is going to bring about everything you want. It's not. This is not heaven on earth. That is still to come. That is the kingdom that Jesus came to inaugurate. He is building now, and He will finish building when He returns. We humans, we have this tendency to be very, very short-sighted. We don't see very far. And we often live as if this world were all that there is. We might not even think that this life is all that there is, but it's not true. Like the Sadducees, those who reject their resurrection, they are badly mistaken. God has reserved the best of the best for what is still to come, for the universe that will endure forever. It will be better than the original creation. It will be a city for God and for His people to dwell with one another for all time. We cannot even begin to comprehend how awesome it will be. But I want to close with at least giving it a shot. And again, from the Word of God, we can trust what He says Let these words of Revelation 21, which describe the new heaven and the new earth, let these rain on your soul as good news about what is to come. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, that is Jesus, said, I am making everything new. Then he said to John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. I will be their God, and they will be my children. The afterlife is real, and it will be amazing. You definitely want to be there. So I implore you, trust in Jesus, trust His Word, trust the power of God, and trust that He is able to make all of it a reality. Trust the Scriptures and the power of God when they testify that the best is yet to come. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we can't even understand, we can't comprehend. Forgive our short-sightedness, God. 
we are so finite. We think so little of you at times, so little of your power and of your word, but God, give us a trust, a deep abiding knowledge that knows you are able and you are good, that you are perfectly and completely strong, and that you are faithful. You will bring about all that you have promised. For those who trust in you, the best is yet to come, God. We pray and ask that that day would come soon, that you would return in glory, that you would put an end to what is broken, to what is dead, to what is wrong in this world. Lord, we know your word tells us that you are delaying not because you, you need to, not because you're still working on it or you're, you're too slow, but rather you are patient. You are patient for you want none to perish. You want none to reach the judgment throne without having put their faith in you. So, Lord, let us work to that end as well. Let us be people who invite others to put their faith in you. If there's anyone listening to this who has not yet trusted in you, who has not given you their lives, who has not said, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to God, let them do that now. May they enter into your kingdom, and may they experience the eternal life that comes through faith in Jesus. May they experience it now, and may they experience it fully in the world that is to come. We look forward to that time. We look forward with deep hope. Hope because of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.